Lately, I've been painting a lot of winter scenes, especially little farmscapes around the area where I live. And I thought I would try something new. I think it's important to push yourself and uh, try new things just to continually up your game and to improve your skills and your observational skills, especially. So something that I thought I would try that was new for me, obviously the, the concept of this is is centuries upon centuries old, but I never really tried it for myself. And that is to just simply paint, in this case in watercolor, just using three colors. And it's my take on um, primary colors. So red, blue, and yellow, your primary colors. And this is the scene that I came up with. Um, so it was from a little country drive and I uh, took a photo of it, and this is really teeny tiny, you can see compared to my head, <laughs> how big this is. So uh, anyway, I don't usually put full tutorials on my YouTube channel, and I thought it was time that I shared something. Some of the um, footage is sped up just to kind of push things along at a, a quicker clip, but I hope you give this a try, I think you should. And like I said, you can, um, you can experiment with different yellows or you can try the ones that I've suggested if you don't have access to quinacridone. It's important that you use fine art pigments when you're mixing colors from scratch so that you don't have a lot of interference from filler and uh, you don't end up with opaque or muddy paintings. So anyway, give it a try and I hope you like this little video. For full tutorials, visit crystalbashera.com slash shop videos. Here we go. So to begin this project, I'm starting with a 2H pencil and it's quite light. It's a nice hard lead. I'm using 140 pound cold press paper and it's mounted in a block. So it's glued on all four sides so I don't have to stretch my paper. The colors we're using are Thalo Blue, Alizarin Crimson, and in this case, Quinacridone Gold is going to serve as my so-called yellow color, but you can use raw sienna or try Indian yellow. I'm gonna make a violet out of the red and blue mixture, and then I'm gonna make a deep gray using all three colors. Apply pale washes of the raw sienna and a little bit of the alizarin crimson to give that golden hour glow. I'm going to let that layer dry or you can speed things up by blow drying it dry with a blow dryer. This will help to stabilize the layer. You're going to need synthetic brushes for your masking fluid. I'm using my number six synthetic ivory round and an ivory rigger. I like using the Pebeo drawing gum for my masking fluid. And to protect my bristles, I use a little bit of Master's Brush Cleaner, but any old hard bar soap will do. So first, I wet my brush, dip my brush in the soap, swipe some of the soap off, and start applying the masking fluid. It does not need to be thick in order for it to protect the pure paper or the colored areas. And I'm going to be playing with the different sides of my brush to create a dry brush effect for rougher snow or using the tip of my brush and creating nice smooth shapes. For finer details, I'll use my rigger. So I'm trying to capture little glistening highlights uh, that the light is hitting. The light is coming from the left side of the scene and uh, the barn is a little bit backlit as well. So what I'm doing here is just preserving any highlights. So there was very little pure white left in the scene at this time of day. It was more of a golden peachy glow. So that's what I'm trying to protect right now. And I like using a liner because it holds on to a lot more of the masking fluid than a short bristled brush. Of course, you can find these brushes on my website.
So I'm just going in and capturing really fine edges here, a little bit of the corrugated tin. So I'm using a dotted sort of touch. And notice too that I've also masked out the barn window on top of the yellow glow. So yes, you can mask on top of paint. Once this is all dry, I'm going to manipulate the surface of the masking fluid by lightly rubbing my finger over the surface of that rubbery kind of texture. And this is going to open up these beautiful scalped edges and textural pockets. It'll give you a much more natural effect. Now I'm going to apply water to the sky and this will create a nice skin on the surface of the paper so that your next layer of paint doesn't penetrate the paper and stain the paper right away. So this buys me a little bit of time. Ultimately, this is considered a wet into wet technique. I'm using my big one inch thirsty red brush. I like using um, either a natural hair or at least a blend so that um, the water is held really well in the brush. Now I'm using my number 10 pointed round. I'm applying phthalo blue at the top and I'm letting some of that underpainting of the peach tones show through. So I'm not applying the phthalo blue to the entire surface. I'm letting these beautiful wispy underpainted values or hues to come through and give me that nice golden streaked sky. And the paper's still very, very wet here, so you can see it, it's flowing beautifully. Now, if I want to punch out any harder edged highlights in the sky or clouds, I can just use some tissue and I crush up the tissue and press down fairly hard. If I want some wispy kind of jet streaks in the sky or wispy streaks for the clouds, I can blot twisted Kleenex to achieve a more linear look. So while the sky is drying, I'm actually going to start applying some color to the snow. I'm using alizarin crimson and it's quite diluted. Because it's diluted, some of that underpainting, that gold base that we have is going to show through. So it's going to come across as being kind of peachy. I'm using my number 10 pointed round, my designer blend. Now I'm using a little bit of the quinacridone gold. I've added that to the alizarin crimson to give me a rich peachy color. And again, I'm working on dry here because I want sharp shapes. Notice that I'm playing and alternating between using the tip of the brush and then sometimes the belly of the brush to give me broader strokes. And while I'm working on the dry surface, I'm sometimes going back and adding pigment to existing um, wet areas just so that it bleeds and gives me a softer look. Here I'm using alizarin crimson, again, quite diluted, a little stronger than the first time. I want to add a bit of pink to the snowbanks. I don't want them to be gray or blue. I want them to have a nice wide range of values as well as hues. While I'm at it, I'm adding alizarin crimson to the silo and the little outbuilding that uh, shed on the right hand side. And here I'm just going to bleed out so that we get a bit of a gradated wash. It's lighter on the left hand side and a little darker on the right side. Switching to my rigor, still using the alizarin crimson, just kind of scribbling in a very rough shrub. And I really do want to just maintain that sketchy kind of feeling. Again, while I'm at it, I'm going to sketch in some of the layers of tin on this barn. I want to keep these lines kind of broken and simple. Here I'm using a bit of alizarin crimson with the phthalo blue, which is of course red and blue, giving me a bit of a violet tone. Again, using a sketching kind of stroke, I just want things to look really natural and 
because of the nature of my subject matter being very rural and kind of rustic looking, I don't want any super clean, rigid, rigid lines. So I'm going to let all of this dry. Once it's dry, I'm going to re-wet the barn surface. And again, I'm using my number 10 designer blend. So I'm wetting the entire facade of this barn. Again, this will allow the paint that I bring in to just sort of flow beautifully on the surface without it penetrating and staining the paper right away. So I've made kind of a blueberry by mixing primarily phthalo blue and then just adding a little bit of alizarin crimson to it. So I've pre-mixed that in the palette and now I'm bringing it to the wet surface of this barn and notice how the paint just flows effortlessly over the surface. And at this stage, I actually want a range of value here. So I want some lights, some darks, some mediums. Notice when I'm painting the edges that I point my brush to the outer edge and then the belly is inside the shape. That will give me much cleaner lines. I've got a mixture of gold and alizarin crimson on my brush and what I'm doing here is just kind of streaking it into the active paint, the wet blue that I had laid down just a moment ago. And in no particular pattern, I'm just kind of adding blobs to create a bit more fluctuation in the range of color on the surface. Now I'm tilting my board and I'm applying water to the upper edge. This will give me a more light diffused look as if the light is sort of radiating from behind the barn and it'll be a little bit darker at the base of the barn. And I'm just letting that paint collect on the edge against the snowbank. Just watch that your beads don't over spill into the nice white snowbank. <laughs> Once it's dry, it always ends up a little paler as you can see. Don't fret, we'll just add another layer. And again, I want to wet into wet. I want soft results here. So I'm re-wetting the surface and applying phthalo blue. Now I'm adding a little of alizarin crimson and I'm mixing violet right on the surface of the paper. So rather than mixing it in the palette, I've just kind of stirred them up and mixed them together. Again, pointing the tip of the brush to the outer edge for clean lines. and the belly of the brush remains inside the shape. I want to work quickly here because I don't want the paint to dry for this to be streaky. I want everything to look really soft and fluid and dreamy. And notice that I'm still kind of keeping that upper portion of the barn quite pale for that light diffused look. That shed is dry, so I'm actually just doing a little bit of dry brush streaks and adding a bit of texture there. This brush is incredibly uh, versatile because of that fine tip. It's like having three brushes in one, so um, I barely have to switch to any other brush when I'm using it. So the sky is dry and that's going to allow me to create nice dark, sharp shapes. I still have all of my masking fluid on. So just paint as though um, you've got nothing to worry about in terms of retaining your highlights. I'm using alizarin crimson just to create a bit more visual interest. It's like a kind of a cranberry color, alizarin crimson with maybe just a little bit of phthalo. This kind of enhances the roof line. Just creating a tiny bit more contrast. Notice that this entire painting, like most of my paintings, has been painted light to dark and largest, lightest areas first. Also all of the wet into wet techniques generally go in first 
and I work my way to drier, darker details. So just adding a little bit of that cranberry kind of color to um, the shed and then that little mini storage, almost like a little mini silo. Once that's finished, I just let that completely dry. I've created a darker violet combination out of the red and blue, just a bit more saturated. And I'm going to start painting in the silo. Notice I've added water to that left edge to diffuse it, make it a little bit lighter in value as we move towards the sunlight. and a little bit of water to bleed out the edge to make a softer transition using just the tip of the brush and barely any water. I don't want to flood it or I'll end up with a bloom. Let's have a look at that again. So on the edge of my paint, I bring in just a little bit of water to the very edge, very, very, very edge, just using the tip, not dragging the, the belly of the brush through, just the tip. Now I'm adding a darker cranberry color again, a more dominant alizarin crimson tone, just to add some texture and um, a little bit more contrast and some lines and details to the silo. And back to that darker blueberry kind of color, which is a violet with a bit more of a phthalo blue influence. I really want to make that left hand side glow. So I'm bringing in that quinacridone gold to the left hand edge and just letting the sun kind of um, radiate off of that outer edge. And to integrate it, I'm just dragging it through. The blue and the alizarin crimson mixture is still a bit damp here, so that allowed me to cut into it with the gold. So while that's all drying, I'm just going to, again, sort of that blueberry color, uh, leaning towards more of a violet tone. On the dry snow, I'm adding some darker, contrasting, crunchy shadows. And this must be done on dry. And I'm just trying to be playful here, adding some interesting shapes and trying to catch the edges of the uh, shadowy side of the snowbank. And my pure hot highlights are all protected under there with the masking fluid, so I don't have to worry too, too much. So I'm gonna grab my fan brush and I'm just going to streak a little bit of that blueberry color up and through the barn to achieve a bit of a corrugated tin texture. And notice that I'm, for the most part, brushing from the base up. And then I can kind of fluff in a few extra lines. I don't want anything too stiff and rigid looking. The more you try to define the texture of the barn, the phonier it's going to look. So I don't want it looking like a cartoon or overly contrived. So I'm just kind of sketching in the lines very loosely. And I can start on the edges of the panels and just pull down. If anything's looking too perfect, I just kind of run a brush over to wreck it a little bit. So here I am going back to a heavier violet and my big number 10 <laughs> and just creating a few more ruts in the snow to create much more contrast, blotting as I need to, change the value. At this point, I don't worry too much about the tip of the brush staying pointed. A little bit of texture is actually quite welcomed, so I can use it like a dry brush. The more value range I have in my snowbanks, the more interesting it's going to be. So not only a fluctuation of color moving from cranberry to violet to 
a blueberry color, but also I want to change the value. So I realized that I'd like to add a little bit more to my barn at this stage, just to make it a little bit more dramatic. So because I know my shapes are going to be soft and fluid, I'm pre-wetting that area once again with relatively clean, <laughs> clean water. Don't judge me, my water uh, jars are quite dirty at this stage. This is just phthalo blue now, really setting things ablaze here and playing up the cool versus warm tones. Taking that phthalo blue right over the dry snowbanks and adding bold, bright shadows. Again, alternating between using the fatter belly of the brush and then switching to using the tip of the brush. Now it is getting a little harder to see where my highlights are at this stage, but uh, once again, I have to trust that I've applied enough masking fluid to those areas so that it is um, salvageable. So I'm just dragging out, elongating some of those shadows, making the sun feel like it's a little bit closer to the horizon and creating those long, lean golden hour shadows. Once again, to emphasize the hot and cold colors, I'm just adding an extra bit of blue to the right hand side, which is our predominantly shadowy side and fading out with more diluted paint or even just water on my brush. So you notice in the snow that the closer my shadows are to light or to sunlight, the, pe the more peachy those tones appear. So I can use the reds and pinkier tones on the outer edges of the shadow and then cooler tones in the heart of the shadow and certainly move to like really dark values in the deepest crevices. So I still have masking fluid over my yellow window and I'm just creating a bit of a shadowy frame to show the insert of the window or the casing of the window. And I do want to, um, I don't know if you can tell here, but I was adding just a little bit of tin texture. So kind of letting some of that dark travel up the corrugated um, ribbing on the, on the tin. Starting to sketch in the door, starting with the outer frame and the track. And using that blueberry color. So here I'm filling it in and then I'm adding a little water to soften or bleed out the edge just so it's not so defined. I kind of like the look of it being that lost edge. It's so important to have a variety of edges, lost and found edges. So again, I can kind of blot to clean things up or to lighten the paint. Here I'm just going in and just sort of fluffing the tissue to lighten pockets because I, I don't want that door looking too blacked out and solid. So that just helped me uh, increase the range of value in that shape. And I'll do a similar thing over here with this bigger door. Again, just dropping in the darkest colors, even going to that final gray, which is all three, the quinacridone gold, the alizarin crimson, and the phthalo blue, just dropping it right in the heart of that dark space and letting the edges be a little bit lighter. Now, certainly if you can't keep shapes like this wet, you can always let them dry 100%, re-wet, and then drop darker values inside. And I'm just dragging some of that paint color out. 
And again, just increasing the range of value and texture. Really subtle work here just to finish this off. We're in the last stretch. And just another glaze over top of the shed. I really want this to feel like it's in shadow, so I want to make sure that my values are accurate and my darks are as dark as they can be without being entirely black. And finishing off the roof line. Obviously, we don't have a red roof per se, but that little bit of a lizard and crimson kind of gives that gray tin roof a bit of a golden glow. And then I can clean up the edges afterwards or bleed them out if need be. Be sure to check out the link below for a promo code that you can use to shop for my custom line of brushes. So just going into that darker value again and enhancing some of the contrast. A little bit more texture using that gray tone kind of stamping with the brush, creating a bit of a dry brush look. I love creating shrubs with my fan brush. It's like the perfect tool. And um, this one is called the fling and the bristles stay beautifully splayed. I can use the corner of the brush or that last little frond to kind of sketch and if I want finer details, I can move to my rigger for more spindly kind of branches. I want to keep this really sketchy, very loose, nothing too rigid here. Using kind of an amber color for the backlit tree in behind the silo in the barn and then to soften and kind of smush these shapes together, just stamping over it with a little bit of water on my fan brush. Again, always looking for a range of value to create a bit more dimension in whatever shape that I'm painting. It's very rare that it's just one solid, even value. Blotting again with tissue is a quick way to lift up the pigment and to increase your highlights. Once this is completely dry, again, you can use a hair dryer if you want to, you can remove all of the masking fluid. And I'm just using a rubber cement pickup, but you can use your finger. On larger paintings, it's nicer to use the rubber cement pickup because it can be, especially if you've got lots of masking fluid, can be kind of, um, obnoxious on your fingertips. <laughs> so now I'm kind of cleaning up with a stiff, sharp, flat brush. It's got a little bit of water on it. And I can use this more rigid flat. This is my quarter inch. I can use this to soften edges that I feel are too harsh and stand out too much and kind of give um, a shape, sort of a cut out and paste it on look. I don't want that. So I'm just lifting the pigment up to soften it. The painting itself is dry, but by having a little bit of water on this stiff brush, I can actually reactivate that pigment and lift it away. So I'm kind of scrubbing at the edge. And then if a lot of pigment builds up, I can blot to kind of sop up that extra bit. So here I'm using kind of a circular motion to scrub up the paint and soften that rounded edge on the roof of the silo. Here, once again, I want the light to feel a little bit more diffuse, so I'm just softening that edge. Sometimes the masking fluid 
um, can be a little harsh looking. It always gives you a really hard, hard edge. So if you don't like the look of that, this is the last step. It's just taking a damp, stiff brush and scrubbing up some of those hard edges. So what happens here is I don't have paint on my brush. I'm just taking water on my brush and activating the edge of the paint and kind of bringing it into that open space of the white of the paper. And then I quickly blot it up before it stains the paper. So this just gives a softer transition between the harshness of the painted shape and the brightness of that dried edge. Adding a little bit more color to the window. Playing up the warm and cool colors here by increasing the reflective sun that's kind of setting and creating that, again, that beautiful amber glow. Again, just lifting and softening any highlights or hard edges. Once everything is completely dry, I can go in and if needed, just add a few nice crispy accents. Here I'm just using that cranberry color. So there you have it, a sweet little barn painting in a little less than an hour and a half, made very simply with three colors, phthalo blue, alizarin crimson, and quinacridone gold. And just those three colors alone gave a beautiful range of value and hues. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. To take some of the guesswork out of your color mixing, I've created a series of color recipe cards that you can download from my website. Achieve more harmony, balance, mood, and atmosphere by using these easy to follow instructional cards. Learn more or download them now by clicking here. For the complete list of art tutorials that I have available, visit my website www.crystalbeshera.com slash shop videos or you can check out the vimeo.com slash channels slash art tutorials website. Thanks for watching everybody and happy painting as always. See you the next time.